Welcome everyone to the podcast. This is Mo. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, thank you for tuning in today. And to our regular listeners, welcome back. This week's episode, which is a live show, is one I have been waiting to um, do for a while. And because I've known this person for, I want to say, about eight years now, if I'm correct. So um, we met in school, we met in grad school, and she is a plant biologist who is currently working on a PhD project on plants, insect interactions at the great Imperial College in London. She was born in Austin, Texas, and grew up moving between several co- different cultures. Um, learning organic vegetable gardening at an early age taught her how to appreciate the challenges of sustainable food production, as well as the importance plants, plants have in human health and well-being. Consequently, her PhD project explores the genetic basis of plants, innate biological resistance to aphids. Aphids are a pest of many economically important plant species, or they also call them the mosquitoes of plants. And Kashi has also um, ex- has experience in teaching and mentoring undergraduates and master's students in the practical and philosophical areas of research. And her goal is to help her students develop a growth mindset and scientific curiosity. She has presented her research for professional audiences and as well as the general public. As you can imagine, those two are quite different sometimes. On many occasions, she's done this. And she also has a science communication and social media presence as Cassia, plant scientist. She enjoys the outdoors as well as making art, public speaking, and learning about other cultures. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming Kasia Huga to the podcast. Hi, Kasia. Hi, hello there, Talani. It's so great to see you again. And I just want to say many thanks for having me here today. I'm excited to be part of your event and to share some of my stories and ideas today. Of course, of course. This this has been just um, a welcoming and I'm super excited as well. And for those that are in the chat, remember, if you have any questions, um, shoot it and we can put it in the chat. We'll attend to it. If you want to unmute uh, during the Q&A session, we'll take that as well. So, um, Kasia, we usually start with the basic questions. I'm, I'm probably sure you saw that coming. So maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. And I know you lived as a third culture kid. Now, for mm-hmm. those that are um, maybe wondering what a TCK or a third culture kid means, it's really someone who was um, born in a culture or grew up in a culture or raised in a culture other than their parents' culture or the culture of their, you know, Beth home and whatnot. So, um, or the country of their nationality and also live in a different environment during a very significant part of their developmental years as children. So uh, tell us about your experience growing up and your geographical footprints as it were. <laughs> well, many thanks, Talani. Yes. So my name is Katja Hogard and I am, I have both a Danish and an American passport. And I can thank my lovely parents for those nationalities. My late father, who we have a portrait of back there, uh, he was from Denmark, and my mom, who I'm glad to say is still alive and well, uh, is from America. So my mom and dad, they met because my dad was working in the oil and gas business, and his work He was a third culture adult, I could say, even though he spent his growing up in Denmark and even survived the perils of World War II as a young child in Copenhagen. Yes, he he often would tell me stories about, um, say, like the Germans invading Copenhagen and Denmark and some of the scary experiences he and his family went through when he was a young child there in World War II. So he um, he passed away last year at the ripe age of 83, but I feel very honored to have gotten to know somebody who lived in such different times from me so he could share his experiences and perspectives. But as an adult, he left Denmark and traveled all around the world for his work as an oil and gas geologist, and eventually that work took him to Texas. He met my mom, who was a native of Houston, Texas, and whose family are Americans of British descent who had lived in in the States since at least, we think, the 1600s. Wow. So these two really hit it off through their shared love of art, culture, history, uh, classical music, good food. And my mom had always been kind of a Europhile, you might say, an American who felt like European culture and values really resonated with her. So my parents 
had a somewhat globe-trotting lifestyle before I was born. And when I came along, my parents decided to uh, have a bit of an unconventional family life and to divide their year between three to four different places. And consequently, I did a lot of my education through correspondence course because with moving around around the world, pretty much having different homes for different seasons, it, enrolling in a traditional school wouldn't have been that user-friendly. So that was fine for me. I think that the benefits of getting to grow up in different cultures and have more of a global perspective outweighed probably what I missed out on by attending a traditional school experience. And plus, I had a great school experience in college. So I think I more than made up for it there with all the kind of activities, social life stuff, et cetera. You were always busy. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, yes. I'm glad I carpe DM'd the heck out of UT because now I'm a homebody here thanks to the pandemic and other situations we'll discuss later. That's what but, happens. Uh, the pendulum always shifts from one extreme true, to the that's other. True. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I, I took my chance there. Uh, yes. So I spent part of my growing up here in England um, in both a rural environment here in the Cotswolds and also an urban environment in London. I also spent some time as a child in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Uh, I also spent a lot of time in Austin, Texas. And we also, as a family, spent time on the island of Kauai in the state of Hawaii. Which, Hawaii? Uh, Hawaii, I yes. I spent I a lot of my that. teenage years in Hawaii, yes. Wow, mm -hmm. lucky you. So you're always swimming on the beaches, doing the mahalo, I, mahalo sign? Uh, well, yeah, actually, my parents and I learned traditional Hawaiian dance and music when we were there. It was something wow. that we as a family were really into, like learning the traditional Hawaiian dances and getting really involved in that local cultural scene of music and dance. Wow, that's, mm -hmm. that's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, so I would say that my growing up was a very multicultural one. Yeah. Um, so it gave me experiences that a lot of people wouldn't get to have, such as learning how to grow your own food here at, in our garden in the English countryside. I also got to um, enjoy life in Austin. And of course, Austin is a very multicultural city in Texas and yes. more liberal. So I also got to... Um, just enjoy the things about being a kid in Austin, too. And um, in Denmark, I think that uh, spending some time in Denmark gave me a, an appreciation of, of a place that's quite culturally different and also about how bikes and public transportation can support a highly developed uh, civilization that, you know, you don't have to have an advanced civilization with cars being the main mode of transport. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that seeing how eco-friendly the lifestyle in Denmark was compared to some other places was quite an eye opener, like how they were very into using wind power and uh, eating organic food and living healthily before that became fashionable across the rest of the developed world. And of course, Hawaii, I think that the unique South Pacific Island culture was a great thing to experience. And also, my dad and I were very interested in learning about the local nature, like the plants, the animals. Also, yes, spending time on the beach hunting for shells and looking in tide pools to see what interesting creatures I could find. So wow. really, I, it was a very, a very fortunate experience growing up to get to experience all those things. It really just fostered my curiosity and I think open mindedness. That's a definite lesson for parents who might be watching this, how you can mm -hmm. foster your your children's um, interest at a very mm -hmm. early age. So you are the only child, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. I just wanted to um, explain that. Now, you've visited several countries, I imagine. What has been the most interesting country for you and why? Mm. Well, uh, so in addition to living in those different places, um, also my parents and I did a lot of traveling in Europe as well. I would say that a country I would like to go back and see more of would probably be Spain, because I think that as a person who's come from Texas, going to Spain was quite eye-opening because I saw how many things in Texas are actually things from Spain originally. Even the look of the people, like in Madrid, the, the people of Madrid looked so much like the white and Hispanic Texans. It was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, because... Uh, Texas used to be part of the empire of Spain. I yep. think that's where we get all that influence from. Yeah. from they has, it was the style of, friend in, in Spanish, right? Yeah. True, true. And uh, say like the look of the gardens, the architecture, um, mm. also just things about sort of aesthetics and all really reminded me of Texas. So I would love to go back and explore more of Spain and its rich culture and history and learn more about it. 
But yes, to tell a little bit more about myself and my story. So after this somewhat globetrotting growing up, I ended up spending a lot of time in Austin, Texas, because that's where I did my undergraduate education. I started out at Austin Community College, where I studied for a couple of years. And after that, I transferred to UT Austin, University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns. And that's where I met the lovely Tolani and made many other lifelong friends at the UT Sciences Toastmasters Club. And um, at UT Austin, I was studying biology with a focus on plant biology. And I got to do undergraduate research uh, with Dr. Rue and Dr. Clark at their lab. And from there, at that point, I thought research was a very good fit for a career for me. So mm -hmm. I came back to the UK and did a master's program in plant biology at Imperial College. And mm -hmm. from there, that was a segue into a PhD program mm -hmm. in plant biology with a focus on plant and aphid interactions. And I'm currently completing my thesis at the end of this PhD program. But back to you, Talani. Wow. I mean... Let's just start with this question. And I, I'm asking because mm -hmm. I'm seeing quite a number of um, familiar names who are from my mm -hmm. country. Plant science is not a popular degree way back home in Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. Because some parents, and you have to get this. Let me put some, uh, let me balance the message. Because sure. our country has gone through a lot to kind of get to where it is. And we still have a lot of growing to do economically. So parents are always trying to make sure that children choose like degrees that can end them at least decent wage when they get out of the house. So courses like in STEM, like, you know, engineering, medicine, pharmacy, nursing, those are the ones you tend to see a lot of parents way back in the day. Urge their, and I say urge, I'm, I'm using that word lightly. <laughs> Sometimes we'll force them to go study because they want them to like, you know, earn more money. But I imagine for you, it's probably different. What forged your love for plants? And by the time you decide this is what I want to study, how was that? Was your, were your parents totally, you know, for it or were there some concerns they had about, you know, your viability as an adult and all that? Um, no. So my parents were always very supportive of me earning a STEM degree because they knew as since they were my teachers, they knew I had a real aptitude for science and also a very genuine love of natural history and biology. The nice thing about my parents is they've always been very open minded and um, supportive and also that idea that, you know what, if you do some training or education and you find out this isn't for you, we're not going to judge you because it's never too late to make a new start in life. Mm -hmm. That's always kind of been they've been very kind of very chilled about it, I would say. So uh, what really fostered my love for plant science, I would say, was learning organic fruit and vegetable gardening here in our garden at our family home in England. From that age, from ever since I was old enough to walk pretty much, I have been helping in the garden. And the process of growing plants, putting the effort into looking after them, seeing them grow, and then seeing them eventually produce delicious, healthy food for you to cook with, just that whole kind of circle of life aspect of working with plants is something that's made a lot of sense to me from an early age. And if you're gardening, you really have to understand what plants need, how to meet their needs, and how to get them what they need in terms of nutrition, light, physical support, in order for them to do their best. So, because my mom and I were always experimenting and innovating with how to grow our plants and make them as productive and healthy as possible, this really fostered this natural scientific curiosity and also innate scientific way of thinking. So, also out here in the country, certainly when I was younger, there was a lot of unsustainable agriculture that we observed, like, say, excessive use of pesticides and fertilizers. I'm glad to say that more farms here in the Cotswolds have gone the way of being organic and more wildlife friendly, so I'm really happy to see that. But seeing that firsthand made me think, is there some tr contribution I can make in the world of science that would help make plant food production based off plants more sustainable. When I got to my undergraduate studies, I knew I wanted to work on biology, and I got a great opportunity to work in a plant physiology lab at UT Austin with Dr. Rue and Dr. Clark, who are champions of undergraduate research. I found, I thought they were absolutely inspiring mentors. They were very kind and supportive towards me, and they were sincerely interested in plants. And a lot of their research had to do with making plants more resistant to environmental stress like drought. So 
through doing research with my mentors there, I really could, and also attending things like scientific talks, presentations, research, uh, poster presentations, things like that, I could see that plant science was not studied enough, that there was a real need for more people working on plant science and looking at fundamental research of how plants work and how we can make them more resistant to stress and more productive. And uh, I just really liked that connection between sustainable agriculture and understanding how plants work. So that's what kind of got me on the path of working in plant science. So you were exposed to it, but then you saw like a gap to fuel and you realized this is something I can do to help with sustainable food production. Mm -hmm. Hence your, you know, your love and passion for that. Um, before I move on to the my next question, mm -hmm. we have a... Sure. Uh, a question from Miri. Miri wants to know which plants will roll the future in terms of nutritional energy, nutrition or energy or other fields? Well, plants ruling the world. I don't think any plants have megalomaniac ambitions. There's no but... chat, there's no chat GPT plants coming up anytime soon. <laughs> Not that I know of. Well, I would say that uh, plants that instead of let's Plants generally don't have dreams of grandeur like ruling the world. So let's say what plants are likely to be successful in our changing climate. And I would say those are plants that are the most adaptable. So uh, think about some of the plants that are considered invasive plant species, such as the infamous kudzu vine. <laughs> and there are other kinds of invasive plants all over the world. There are also plants that thrive in harsh conditions. And right now I'm thinking about uses for invasive plants and plants that can grow where nothing else wants to grow. And how can they be useful to humans? I have a feeling that things like kudzu could possibly be processed into biofuels because they just grow like weeds. And I can also think of an example of a research project that was quite important at UT Austin when I was there studying between 2012 and 2016. And this was the switchgrass biofuels project. So switchgrass is a tough, hardy native grass that's found throughout the southern United States. And there were several research groups looking into growing switchgrass on land that was unsuitable for other types of agriculture because this grass was tough as nails. It could survive salt, drought, um, strong UV light, you name it. So they were looking into how to grow this on unproductive land as a biofuel source. So I think plants that could be important in the future are very adaptable and tough ones that could grow where other things don't want to grow, but that they could be useful in terms of producing biofuels, perhaps building materials, also perhaps as a food source for humans as well. But anyway, on with the show. I think we have a follow-up question from Jonathan. Ooh. What plant species, and I love the questions, by the way, and I mean, I mind these are all your friends because the questions are so um, <laughs> different from the one I would ask. Yeah, uh, jo Johnny is my good friend. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Johnny. Well. <laughs> what plant species are doing badly in comparison with invasive ones, like climate change and the pollutants being taken into account? Oh, good example. Uh, you know, thanks for that one, Johnny. I can think of many examples of plant species here in the UK that are losing ground to invasive plants and to climate change in general. So the thing we've got to bear in mind with climate change is the planet has always been changing. You know, think about it. It's just that climate change is, is happening at a faster pace and in more unpredictable ways, thanks to the carbon dioxide that the industrialization of the world has released into the atmosphere. So here in the UK, there are many species of native trees and wildflowers that are not as well adapted to the hotter and longer summers and drier conditions that we now have in the UK compared to several centuries ago. One native species I recently learned about is the linden, the small leafed linden tree. You may have heard of linden trees. They're a kind of tree that's quite common in Germany and Central Europe, but not as common here in the UK. So these linden trees used to be common in the medieval times, so common that they were a popular building material with their wood, but they have become rarer and rarer because nobody is replanting them and because generally they aren't as well adapted to the hotter, drier summers that we now have here in the UK compared to how summers were a century or two ago. Thank you so much, Johnny, for that question. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Well, so just to start, start with your career trajectory, right? Mm-hmm. You yep. started at UT Austin, Hook and Hans, and that's how we met. Mm-hmm. And then, but how do you, how does one make a move from, I mean, UT Austin is also very, um, a very good school and <laughs> quite um, renowned in its own right. Mm-hmm. But moving from there to the UK, that's like moving countries, one moving culture, even though you're familiar with it. But I mean, targeting a laudable and even like a well renowned school like Imperial College, for those who might be wanting to walk down this path, or maybe coming from a place where whatever they're seeing right now doesn't even look like where they want to be, what are some nuggets you might provide to them as far as reaching their goals? Well, that's a great question, Tolani. Thank you for asking it. I can certainly share my tips about how to make the transition to graduate school if you feel like that's something you want to do. My number one tip for getting into a PhD program at a a notable university is to make a personal connection with a supervisor you would like to work with. This is my top tip. So I would say that in a year, in the year or two leading up to starting graduate school, I would recommend writing letters of introduction via email to professors at the schools you'd like to attend whose research interests you or has some relevance or connection to what you studied. Even better if you've done some undergraduate research. This is what I did in the year leading up to uh, graduating from UT and moving on to graduate school. I did a bit of science tourism here in the UK because I knew I wanted to come back to the UK for graduate school. And what I would do is, is I would ask, I would just write this letter in a very uh, formal, you know, professional and formal, respectful way, but also not pressuring the supervisor to provide me with a PhD project. It was more like a letter of interest where you talk about how you're interested in what that professor is studying ask about possible future PhD projects with this professor. And then I think the best thing to do is to ask if you can come to that professor's lab and take a look around and meet some of their current graduate students. You would be surprised at how many uh, supervisors took me up on this offer. I would say that over 50% of them did invite me to come look around their lab and meet with them. And this was great. I had a wonderful excuse to get to go to Oxford, Cambridge, and other places and just kind of look around, be a tourist for the day, have a look at the place. And some supervisors I met, I think it was a good thing we we did meet in person because I know I, I wouldn't have gotten along with them in the long run, and I didn't like the atmosphere at their lab. But say in the case of the lab I did end up, I thought that the atmosphere seemed good and I liked the professor, and he was able to help me find funding. So that's how I could end up working as a PhD student in his lab at Imperial College. But I really would say don't underestimate that personal reaching out and making the connection with the supervisor. Because if a supervisor really wants to have you on their team, they can often find sources of funding and help you get funding for your PhD project. Back to you, Talani. I mean, those are good tips. And I know for those that are believing in countries that are so far away, they're not able to hop on a flight. That mm-hmm. advice um, Katya gave, mm-hmm. I actually did exactly that. But mine was just restricted through emails. So what I would do is um, I would send an email <coughs> to either the course coordinator or the professor. Mm-hmm. Now you have, you have had to do your due diligence, guys. You have gone on their websites taking a look at the portfolio of the professors and then look at their publications if you want to know what their lab mm-hmm. is about. Because sometimes, depending on how the website is set up, you might not be able to have access to this information. But then talk about yourself. Do not make it, don't put any attachments to the email because they don't know you, they might not open it. Make sure the body of your letter has everything you have to say and follow up if you don't hear back. You know, here's a gentle reminder. I'm so interested. It works for me. It's how I landed, you know, at UT and the rest of the sales history. And I'm so glad you're able to remind, you know, everyone about that tip. It's a it's a fail proof tip that works almost all the time. Mm-hmm. All right. That, Sorry, those are great. Those are great additions, Talani. Thank yeah. you for adding those. I would also say it's important to try to have a video chat yes. with the supervisor and his or her current graduate students too, if you're not if you're not able to travel there to meet with them. Exactly. Or even do like a virtual um, look around of the lab. Ask mm-hmm. to speak with 
past alumni and even current mm-hmm. students because there's so much you can only see when you go there the first time you mm-hmm. need to be able to get your intel from multiple sources once you've decided that maybe i'm interested in this but whenever you're in that moment of excitement you might be you might be prone to a lot of bias where you don't see everything like confirmation bias this is why you need to get your sources from both those who have gone through the university what are their career portfolio like did they get a job what kind of jobs are they doing what's their alumni network right like are they very supportive of the current student funding sources you know the rest you know you can always figure out so let's go back to plants you know mm-hmm. um can you have a confession i'm like a, you know how to say green thumb I'm, i think i'm like a black thumb <laughs> like plants whenever they come to my house they lose their will to, to leave you know oh, that's just and, and this is it. Uh, but I, I would say that my longest um, living plants right now is clocking about the two year mark. Mm. And the um, the reason is I just used to over, I forget about the plants. And when I, by the time I remember them, I just overwatered them. And of course, that doesn't really help. So my question for you would be this, <laughs> how should and why should the average person care about plants and plant biology? <laughs> Well, Talani, I have a confession to make too. I'm not actually much of a house plant enthusiast myself. Excuse you know, I'm, me, I'm, you're growing not... pretty cashy. Are you look well, up behind see, you? Here's a, well, here's the thing. Um, I I actually think house plants are tricky. They're often quite fiddly, yeah. and they can have quite um, finicky likes and dislikes. I'm not. I'm. You know, I think house plants are okay, but I would rather grow a plant that I can eat, or is a perennial plant that can live outside in my garden without too much uh, fussy care. So, funnily enough, I'm. I'm a pretty practical person too, more of an outdoor gardener. I do have a few house plants, like this pothos here, which is a pretty unkillable plant. So, I think that one is safe here. Uh, yes, it, it can be called the devil's eye. I like that well, one. It because well. it's unkillable. Yes, exactly. So I just want to say that houseplants, uh, my hat's off to all of those people who can look after these incredibly delicate and finicky houseplants, because even I, a plant biologist, find them quite uh, challenging to look after at times. So yeah, so why should the average person care about plants? Well, let's let's all take a deep breath. We breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. Where did that oxygen come from originally? The answer is from plants. Plants as well as algae and photosynthetic plankton in the oceans are the source of all of the oxygen here on the, in the atmosphere of Earth that we need to survive. So we can thank plants for oxygen and without it, animal life, human life would not exist. So I think that just getting down to the fundamentals, that's an important reason why we should care about plants. In fact, giant rainforests like the Amazon rainforests are often referred to as the lungs of the planet because of all the carbon dioxide they absorb and all of the oxygen that they release that we human beings and all other animals rely on for survival. So that's a pretty profound reason we should be grateful to plants and care about them. The other is, is that plants are the base of all the food chains in the world. Even if you don't think you eat a lot of plant-based products, think about your processed food. Even your things like, say, potato chips are made from potatoes, bread and other baked goods are often made from wheat flour. All of those are plants. So we get most of our daily calories either directly or indirectly, like in the case of eating protein from animals, cows eat grass, a lot of um, commercially raised chickens eat corn. So plants are the, they are the foundation of all of the food chains and food webs on the planet. So without plants, we also wouldn't have anything to eat. Another reason to care about plants is think about how many medicines, I'm sure Talani as a pharmacy um, student, former student and pharmacist can comment on this too, is that many of our famous medicines are either made from plants or the chemical inspiration for them came from plants. Think about, say, the taxol drug from the yew tree, which is used to treat cancer. And of course, almost everyone has used aspirin at some point in their lives, and that originally came from a chemical in the bark of willows. 
So just think about how many other potential important life-saving medicines there are out there in wild plants all around the world. That is a compelling reason to preserve plant biodiversity as well. I'd also like to say that with plants, um, it's important for our physical and mental health to have a connection with the natural world. And I would say that looking after house plants, maintaining a garden, walking in a park or garden, and visiting natural places like forests are all very important for the mental and physical well-being of humans. So these are some reasons why people should care about plants. Mm -hmm. You know, we all kind of like fall short of taking care of our plants. <laughs> now, um, for people like you who are plant biologists, what do you do and what kind of, what's like the, what are your employers like? What do they look like? So I haven't yet worked as, um, I haven't worked outside of academia yet. In my case, my experience is limited to doing research in a university lab-based setting. And But plant biologists and botanists are employed in a wide range of places all around the world. So say an important job for plant biologists is plant pathology. So this is detecting and understanding diseases and pests of plants. With the world of global trade, plant diseases can easily be transmitted from one continent to the next. And several countries employ a lot of plant biologists as plant pathologists, plant disease detectives in government posts to find plant diseases, like find out about plant diseases that could be brought into the country and could hurt economically important plants. Like I know Australia has an especially uh, well-designed network of all of this kind of biocontrol stuff and uh, plant disease detection. Um, that's very, it's very impressive, their whole system of um, plant pest control there. So that's why I'd say that being a plant pathologist is an important job. Also, say botanical gardens, hire botanists and plant scientists to do research behind the scenes, as well as working directly with the plants that are on display for the public. There, you can also be employed by, say, agrochemical companies or agricultural companies. Plant breeding is also a way that plant biologists can make a living. So that is developing new types of economically important plants, fruits, vegetables, and grains for agricultural companies. I mean, really, there are a lot of different things one can do. Uh, also, a lot of people who have studied plant biology may end up doing a teaching either about plants or about biology in general. So really, there are a lot of different options, both in industry, academia, and in government positions where plant biologists are needed. Wow. Thanks for that. Definitely, <laughs> you have a lot of options, it seems. Mm -hmm. I think something blew my mind a while back. I'm a true mm -hmm. crime fan. I love watching true crime. Mm -hmm. And there was this particular incident where the spouse had you know, killed the other one for, help, mm -hmm. for life insurance. What that means they have. But mm -hmm. they, the way they could nail him down was... His shoe prints, whenever he went to, you know, dig and bury the body, he had um, carried some plants, like, you know, mm -hmm. um, that had, I mean, because it had rained a lot, so they couldn't even, but his boots had, like, some markings of, he took some of the um, tree stuff for him. And by the time they matched the DNA of the tree with that on his shoes, it was a perfect man. And I didn't know plants had, like, distinctive DNAs. I did not know that. So That's very true, yes. Forensic botany um, can also help with, you know, mm -hmm. use of plants in criminal investigations. That's I, very true. It really true. blew my mind. It blew my mind. I didn't know plants had distinctive DNAs, like human oh, beings. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, no. Well, that's the interesting thing, Talani. And also, uh, paleoanthropology and paleobotany have a lot of crossovers because I've also heard of, say, ancient bodies that have been found in bogs or mummified human remains that have been found places. They can tell by what pollen and what plant remains are on the bodies, like in the form of clothing or maybe the person's last meal. Sometimes archaeologists have been able to tell that, say, the place where this person lived thousands of years ago is very different because the pollen in the person's hair on their body was completely different than the plants growing there now. So it can also show how climate has changed and how um, human activity has changed the plant life in a certain area too. Nice. Thanks for that. So mm -hmm. now let's, let's talk about your um, entrepreneurial side, right? Mm -hmm. 
I recall you ventured into serving on not just one, but two startups as an academic advisor. Could you shed more light on what that was like? Uh, so I don't, I think academic advisor isn't the right term for it because uh -huh. I was more um, advising in terms of being a plant science expert. So even though I said I'm not that hot with house plants, I was helping with a house plant startup called Pally Plants a couple of years ago. And that my role there was to write some articles about plant biology in a way that would be understandable for the general public. I also helped design and organize a search engine to help people find the ideal house plant for their home and their needs. And I also was able to advise on a lot of things about, say, plant disease and safety through my connections with the British Plant Pathology Society. So say one of the team members was looking to import house plants grown in India to the UK. So I was able to help her get these phytosanitary certificates through my connections with the British Society for Plant Pathology. So in my role, it was kind of more providing scientific expertise and a more scientific perspective um, on house plants. Like say, I also wrote some articles about debunking myths about house plants. Like do house plants really purify the air in your home? The answer is, slightly but not so much to make a huge difference in your overall really? quality of living yeah really <laughs> Mostly no matter how kind of, many plants i have it doesn't really matter is that what you're saying it, it doesn't make that big of an impact no mm -hmm. i've been right <laughs> yeah it's kind of a rumor that's been perpetuated thanks mm. to a slightly dodgy study that was done by nasa but the conditions of the study were not anything like a home environment it was more like a plant in a bell jar and they were looking at whether it can absorb these uh, air pollutants and it was just in a very enclosed space it was more like looking at could plants be used to help purify air on a space station wow. i mean yes it does make a small contribution to removing pollutants and particulates in the air but it's not so big that it would change the overall air quality of your home mostly wow. the plants are there for their beauty and to uh, remind you of nature and just to cheer you up with their beauty i would say oh my goodness i feel like mm -hmm. um the child who just learned that Santa wasn't real. Because I keep, for those plants that keep dying, I keep buying more. <laughs> now, is there an app that can tell you two things? One, how soon the plant is going to die? And then two, <laughs> like how to take your, like you can take a picture and then take care of the plant. Like how uh, to well, take care you know, um, that was something that right now, uh, the Pelly Plants Company did not really take off. You know how startups often start with a good idea, but I think over 80% of startups fail in their first year. And unfortunately, this is one that really kind of fizzled out before it got started properly. But still, it was a nice experience looking into what goes into starting a small business based on plants. But yes, that was some of the content that we were working on for Pally Plants was um, say practical care advice that was scientifically based for people who wanted to know how to take better care of their house plants. All right. So uh, any other Thank questions you. from the chat? Not yet. I'm still keeping an eye on it, but okay, um, I'll, I'll let you know the moment I get uh, one from the chat. Now, mm -hmm. let's talk. We're still talking about plant because this is really, a, I can't believe I'm having so much fun. Thanks, Katya. You have a very great gift of just communicating science, even to people like mm -hmm. me who are not plant, you know, um, friendly or <laughs> plant inclined, like I would mm -hmm. say. Now, um, what kind of survival, because you mentioned like the Amazonian forest and even the Kudzu vine, what kind of plants, what kind of survival challenges do plants face in the future? And then in nature, for example. Well, so that's a great question. And that's also very closely connected to my research topic. So let's think about the point of view of a plant. A plant, unlike an animal, cannot walk away from a bad situation it's stuck in. Plants are what are called sessile organisms. That means organisms that are rooted in one spot and do not have the option of moving away if conditions get tough. This means that plants have evolved to be very self-reliant and resilient against abiotic and biotic threats. So what's an abiotic threat? Abiotic threat means a threat that is not biological. So this could be things like cold, heat, intense sunlight, lack of sunlight, uh, salt, and other poisons in the soil, and nutritional imbalances. These are some of the main abiotic stresses that plants can face out in nature. However, plants have evolved a lot of ways of dealing with this. 
And the thing with plants is, is that it's rare to find a plant that has resilience against all abiotic biotic stresses. Rather, plants have evolved some kind of strong defense strategies specific to the environments where they originally evolved. So let's talk about um, defenses against hot and cold. Oh, hello. So what's this? It looks like we're suddenly sitting in front of a cozy fireplace here. And I, I cannot hear you anymore, Talani. What's going on? I can hear you now. Um, sorry, please go ahead. You're talking about the um, resistance. Sure. It's that. just you surprised me a little bit with that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take it off now. I was trying yes. to put, change the view. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, so let's think about, so some ways that plants deal with drought. So most plants deal with drought by regulating their stomata. So stomata are tiny little pores, often on the underside of leaves. And when these pores are open, that means that the plant is taking in carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen and water vapor. But this means the plant is losing water. So a simple way that almost all plants can control water loss is by closing the stomata in order to keep the water inside the plant tissues. So this is a so this is a kind of de facto way of preventing water loss. So this is because plant roots will sense water loss in the soil like drought conditions, and they will make a hormone called abscisic acid. And this chemical messenger tells the rest of the plant to close its stomata and to save water. A lot of plants can be killed by freezing. The reason plants get killed by freezing is because plant cells are mostly water. And let's think about it. When water turns into ice, it takes up more room. Think about ice cube trays. For example, you often don't fill them all the way up. You fill them halfway up and then you let the water expand. Same thing with plant cells. Many plants are killed by freezing temperatures because the water expands and it bursts the cells open. So that's why plants that have been frozen often collapse and turn into this horrible brown gooey mush after being hit with frost. However, plants that can survive freezing temperatures, what they will do is they will change the composition of dissolved solutes in the liquid in their cells. So it kind of becomes a natural antifreeze that, that never fully freezes and does not expand as much when it freezes. I thought that was really cool. Explain it. Because I've known about stomata, but when you talk mm -hmm. about, for example, the freezing part of it, mm -hmm. it makes a whole lot of sense. So thanks for Absolutely, that. Um, yes. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so th those are some abiotic stresses. And then biotic stresses, that can be things like plant diseases, which can include viruses, bacteria, fungi, fungi-like organisms, insects, and bigger herbivores like uh, mammals that deer, for example, that would be eating the plants. Thanks. Uh, and we have a comment from um, one sure. of the um, listeners from the Facebook page that said, mm -hmm. Kasia has, um, she's fascinating. She has a great gift of scientific communication. Oh, thank you. That's very kind Encore. of you. I'm glad it's working for you. <laughs> Jonathan um, has, has another question. Thanks a mm -hmm. lot, Jonathan. He said, have you done studies on, or any reading on fossils or extinct plant species from our fossil record? Uh, so you know what, Johnny? Paleobotany is not really my strong suit. I do know, I mean, I have kind of a basic knowledge of fossil plants and plant evolution, but I have to say that I'm much more interested in live plants and plants that are part of the kind of current natural history. But if I had to say, if I had to think of an extinct plant that I think is really cool, I would say it's those giant club mosses that were around in the Carboniferous era. So you know a lot of the coal and oil that we have today, the fossil fuels, um, for some reason there's this weird pop culture rumor that it's made of dinosaurs, uh, which is kind of wacky because if you think about it, most of the biomass uh, that turned into coal and oil was in an era that was millions of years before the dinosaurs ever existed. And most of that biomass was these giant trees and giant club moss trees that existed back in the Carboniferous era. So I do think, I think that if you could travel back in time, I think it would be really cool to travel back in time to the era 
of these great forests that were ferns, club mosses, totally different kind of plants than what make up forests today. And to see what did all of our coal and oil look like when it was still alive and before it became fossil fuels. Mm. Wow. Um, Jonathan, thanks for that question. Again, mm -hmm. if you have more questions, please put them in the chat. Now let's talk about aphids, right? Sure. Um, I didn't know much about them until I started doing more research about you and bringing you when I thought about bringing you on the show, because that's your area of research. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm, I'm always of the opinion that whatever has been created, like whatever we made here would have like a, a benefit and mm -hmm. a disadvantage, right? That they're two sides to things. But it seems so far, like if it's when it comes to plants, they are not good, you know, and because they suck out all the life out of it. Mm -hmm. And it also seems that most of the available ways of getting rid of them could also have some impact on the crop yield. Maybe, after, for example, vinegar, right? That mm -hmm. can also affect, you know, the lifespan of your plants. What about aphids? Why do they have a bad rap? Are there some <coughs> advantages to having them? And I know directly to humans, they don't have any um, untoward effects. Can you just shed more light on aphids and why we should be worried about them? Sure, I would love to tell you about that because that's basically the topic of my PhD project that I'm doing with Professor Colin Turnbull at Imperial College London. I'm just gonna sip a tea. Yes, so aphids. I call aphids plant mosquitoes. So aphids have got several really extraordinary things about their biology to talk about. First of all, when we call them plant mosquitoes, Talani is absolutely right. Aphids are tiny, usually green bugs that have needle-like mouth parts that they use to suck the phloem of plants. Phloem is kind of like the plant circulatory system. That is um, an interior system of plumbing inside plants that carries dissolved sugars, nutrients, plant hormones, and other chemical signals all around the plant. So say like if you break off a leaf and sap comes out, the sap, the kind of sticky stuff is the phloem. And aphids have evolved to have these needle-like mouth parts so that they can drink the phloem very easily without causing a lot of mechanical damage to the plant. So aphids do this because plants have defenses against herbivores. Some of these defenses include making the plant leaves taste bitter when the plant senses that cells are being destroyed and broken open by say a deer coming along and munching on a plant. So if a deer comes on and munches on a tree, then that will release chemical signals to the rest of the tree to say, okay, let's start making our leaves taste bitter by making these natural plant chemicals that make the leaves less delicious to eat. So when another deer comes by a while later and tries to eat the plants, it won't want to eat any more of it because now they taste bitter. So that's a way that plants will respond. But with the aphid, because it uses these very subtle, tiny needle-like mouth parts, the plant often doesn't um, mount such a big defense response. The other thing about aphids is that one little aphid on its own doesn't cause much damage. But the crazy thing about aphids is that they clone themselves, okay? So during most of the aphids life cycle, all the aphids in a population are genetically identical females. And what they do is parthenogenesis. This means virgin birth. And what aphids do, is that they can produce cloned offspring. So these are offspring that are all genetically identical to each other and to their mom without the need to find a mate. Yes, for most of their life cycle, yeah. they are just um, making clones of themselves, basically popping out babies every few days. Huh. So this means so they, they don't need to go find mates or anything. They don't but, need no man. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, they, they do at one point in their life cycle, but most of the time they get along just fine making clones of themselves. I call it attack of the clones, like in the Star Wars film. That is amazing. Didn't know that. I know it's wild. It sounds like something out of sci-fi, but it's science fact. So this is why aphids are dangerous is because they their population increases exponentially in a short amount of time because of this cloning reproduction. Now, this means that plants can soon get overwhelmed with having lots of aphids draining the plant of phloem, but also the aphids uh, make waste like 
their kind of biological waste products make the plant sticky, which can foster the growth of fungus. And also aphids can transmit plant viruses by feeding on different plants, kind of like how mosquitoes can transmit diseases between people and other species. So with aphids, now some of you who know a little bit about evolution and biology might be thinking, well, hang on, is that such a good idea to have your whole species be genetically identical? Doesn't that mean you could easily get wiped out by a disease or something they didn't have resistance to? So, so to, um, to help this problem, aphids do occasionally sexually reproduce when at least the P aphid species I work with, when, when they detect shorter day lengths and lower temperatures, the aphids produce a generation that includes both males and females. So the males and females get together and reproduce sexually. Then the females lay eggs instead of live young, and the aphids' eggs will often be hidden under leaf litter or on the forest floor so that they can overwinter while all the other aphids die off in the winter. Then in the spring, these eggs hatch out into a new generation of females that begin cloning themselves. So that's how aphids do shuffle the genetic deck every year. Okay, you blew my mind. Mm -hmm. um, first, <laughs> when you said plant mosquitoes and you talked about their sharp like those, those are like proboscis, right? Because you have them yes. on, on mosquitoes as well because they take little yes. tiny pieces of your that's skin right. and then you know lay eggs within you. Oh, wow. And then the whole virgin birth. That's very <laughs> creepy. Isn't that oh, wild? Yeah. It's creepy. It's creepy. It's like ugh, <laughs> stuff of nightmare. Okay. Um. The question, there's a question by Mary, mm -hmm. and I'm going to yeah. preface it because I also had a question for you. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try to tie it together. Now, um, I've heard it said somewhere that if you want to, if we want to save the planet, then the future of food is insects, right? For uh -huh. example, fried crickets on the school, school menu, milk made from fly liver, and maybe um, meal one bolognese for dinner. These <laughs> are, you know, environmentally friendly meals we were supposed to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Now for these aphids, there's some benefit to humans, you know, or are these just purely um, to these vampires as oh, is it just purely scientific? Well, I would say that with aphids, um, as far as I know, there's not any potential for making insect protein from aphids. But the reason why we're studying the aphids is to help protect plants better against aphids in the future. I'll get on to the edible insect question in just a few minutes. But first, let me address why are we studying aphids and plants interaction? The answer is, is because many aphid species will, they have a negative impact on crops. And you might think, well, why don't aphids wipe out plants in the wild if they have all of this crazy reproduction and they're so dangerous? Well, the thing is, in the wild, aphids have natural enemies like ladybirds and other insects and birds that will eat them. Also, aphids food plants are not so densely packed in the wild. You may have a plant here and a plant there spread out throughout a forest or a savanna. However, in modern industrial agriculture, when you have hectares of wheat that's all genetically identical because it's an agricultural variety and along comes aphids and that turns out to be their favorite, most delicious kind of plant to feed from, you have a population explosion because in the wild, you would never have that many genetically identical plants clustered all together. So this is why aphids are a problem in agriculture, but not so much in the wild. Now, currently, there are a lot of industrial pesticides for controlling aphid populations, but around the world, the movement is to move away from using so many agricult agricultural chemicals to control aphids. There's more of an emphasis on breeding for naturally resistant plants because some plants through their genetic combination are naturally resistant to aphids. That's where my PhD project comes in. I'm studying a model plant called Metacago truncatula, which is a type of clover. It's related to important pulses. That's um, peas and beans that are economically important and provide a lot of the world's calories. Think about chickpeas, lentils, peas, beans. A lot of those are staple food sources around the world. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at a naturally resistant variety of metacago, and I'm looking at several specific genes that may control this resistance response against aphids. So if we can learn what gene is responsible for it, also what biological process does this gene control, 
that makes the plant resistant to aphids, though that knowledge could be applied to breeding and new varieties of crops or using transgenic technology to transfer the resistance genes into the economically important crop species and thereby make them resistant to aphids. So you don't have to use so much pesticide to control the aphids. The aphids just don't wanna eat your crops. So they'll go back to feeding on plants in the wild and their populations will never get so out of control. So that's, that's pretty much the central topic of my research question. But now, but now I'm going to get on to your edible insects question. So unfortunately, we can't just start harvesting the aphids instead because there's not much to them. They're just sort of little green balls of water mostly. But there are a lot of insect species that could be useful for protein. A lot of these are, are insects that have a larval stage that could be harvested and processed. Or there are things like crickets that people have traditionally eaten in a lot of non-Western cultures for thousands of years. I personally think that protein from insects is a perfectly sane idea. I think it's fine. And I think that especially highly processed types of meat, such as say ground meat that you use in burgers or spaghetti bolognese, stuff like that, um, say fillings for dumplings and pot stickers, all of that stuff. If you think about it, the taste appeal is mostly in the seasoning and how it's prepared. That could be any old protein. I mean, it could be chicken, pork, beef, um, some highly processed animal meat. So I would say that for those, I think that's a great use of insect protein. I think it would be uh, kind of a leap of faith to sort of make a fake beef steak out of compressed worms or crickets or whatever and expect that to be as delicious as the real thing. But I think do that, that now, Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat. Is impossible that what Burger, yeah, well, why not? I think I think they're pretty cool. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm impossibly never touching it. <laughs> That's it. I say not your thing, huh? Just, I don't, I think I'll rather just go for the real thing. If they made it in a different format, maybe, yeah. But the mm -hmm. fact that it's trying to resemble food, but it's, when yeah, I say food, I mean boring. like food that yeah. I'm used to. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that, I definitely think that replacing, say, less environmentally friendly types of protein like beef mm. and, and chicken and all of that, um, animal farming that takes a lot of water, land, resources, et cetera, generates a lot of carbon and methane. Mm. I think it would be fine to replace some of those highly processed meats with protein made from insects. Sure. Yeah. But I think there's always going to be a market for real meat. Um, but I think it could just be more of something you have as a treat rather than a staple Amazing. part of your everyday diet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have tried cricket chip chips before and I did like mm -hmm. it. If they hadn't told me it was made out of crickets, but because it was, it had the um, tortilla chips feel and there were like black dots in it. And I had a friend that wouldn't touch them because she thought they were the eyes of the cricket. And I'm like, oh, no. no. <laughs> but it tasted yummy. And then they had like different like barbecue versions mm -hmm. of nice. it. Um, so I guess a follow-up question for me would be this. Mm -hmm. um, I know I had a friend who, whenever that popular series came, documentary came on Netflix, was it Food mm -hmm. Up or something? About food, almost like convincing you to move from um, being a herb, like a carnivore to a herbivore. And they've stopped eating meat since then. Mm -hmm. As a plant biologist, what's your view on, um, like, I believe that it should be a balance, right? But whatever you can tolerate, maybe religiously or health-wise, do what's best for your health. But what's your view on maybe going strictly vegan as a vegan or vegetarian? What's your view about, about just balanced diet? Like, do you think it should be more plant-focused or what are your opinions on that? Well, my personal views is really do what works the best for you and works the best for your health. I'm with you on that, Tolani. I'm, I'm no zealot when it comes to any of that stuff myself. I do think that veganism and vegetarianism is often a lifestyle choice that has a lot to do with the person's kind of personal moral conscience and kind of um, signing up for a more challenging path, but one that they feel is the more morally correct one. And for some people, veganism is a good way to support and help heal health issues. I will say that I think, I think what makes sense is moderation. So I think that there's nothing wrong with eating animal products. After all, people have been doing this for our whole history. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing unnatural about it. But I do think that given how resource intensive animal production is, I think that we could all get away with eating less meat and eating fewer animal products in our everyday diets. 
So I think that vegetarianism is absolutely fine. I think that there should be more plant-based food options available and that people um, should be encouraged to learn more styles of cooking that use more high quality plant ingredients, just so that people can move away from the idea that we have to eat meat every day. I, I don't eat meat every day. I never have. It's never been my culture, you could say. So, uh, and I'm perfectly healthy. So I would say that just moderation is the key. Yeah. Nigerians just live to chat because we love meat mm -hmm. a lot. And... Well, I, I like it, sure, but I mean, <laughs> I don't need to eat it every single day. And I was yeah. going to say another thing about, about a lot of vegan mm -hmm. ingredients, like think about almond milk. Say almonds is a quite popular product in a lot of vegan food. And to bring things back to insects, a lot of vegan ingredients would not be here without insects because almonds rely on bee pollination. So I would say that if we want to keep having vegan food products, we also need to safeguard wild insects and pollinators so that we can have these vegan options in the future. That's a good point. I think mm -hmm. you're right. Just whatever works for you. And if you're trying mm -hmm. to switch, make sure to um, talk to your doctor about it because you mm -hmm. might be missing out some. Because I know I have friends who, because of their virtue of switching to vegetarianism, for example, they're almost always low on vitamin D, which is very important for your mood, for your bones. So make sure that you're not like, you know, starving yourself. When I mean starving yourself, nutritional, nutritional value of your food mm -hmm. has everything you need. So make sure you talk to your doctor about that switch and run your labs frequently mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, this has been a very exciting conversation. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have a comment from sure. um, for me. She said, thank you, Katya. This has been an insightful se session for me. I learned more about plants than I ever have. Based on your <laughs> experience, I'd like to know more about what my kids what my kids will miss if I choose to allow them to explore the world a bit more, taking them away from traditional schooling system. What exactly do you feel they will miss out on and how can I make it up for them? It's a very good question for me. Well, that, that's a very tricky question because no two people's experience as a third culture kid or doing an alternative education system is the same. It depends a lot on the dynamics in your family home, like how overall kind of how harmonious is your, your family's relationship with one another. Um, I would say that some of the things I don't think I missed out on a whole lot because I think there's a lot of opportunities later in life to make up for that. So say, for example, I didn't have a lot of friends my own age when I was growing up. I didn't do any activities like sports or things like that when I was growing up. It was more kind of having my own hobbies. But when I got to college, I um, I made a lot of lifelong friends in college, and I also got to do more extracurricular activities, too. So I would say that the college experience is one not to be missed, but I would say that from what I've heard from other people, there is a lot of stuff that goes on in, say, middle school, high school, and elementary school that is kind of more kind of a lot of busy work, a lot of also kind of risks of bullying, things like that, you know, kids getting exposed to a lot of bad influences through negative school environments and all, and also perhaps um, some youngsters, just the traditional classroom learning style may not work well for them, so they may end up falling behind academically because um, they're not they can't really fit themselves into the boxes so well. I don't know, since I never attended a traditional school, I don't know exactly what I missed. I think it would be, I think, uh, Funmi, I would encourage you to have a chat with other people who have had non-traditional experiences growing up. But something that I can recommend and that I think my parents were very smart to do is to make sure that your kids follow a recognized school curriculum, whether it's online or any other alternative form of learning. Because I have met some folks who also had an unconventional growing up, and if they didn't follow a traditional curriculum that has you know, your set subjects, say that you would learn in the American K through 12 program, or say the British education system, or whichever education system is best aligned with your cultural values, then they end up with big gaps in their general knowledge. So I would say that definitely following a curriculum so that the kids will earn the equivalent of a high school degree at the end of it is a very good investment for their future prospects for getting into college. Um, you, couldn't have said, you couldn't have said it. You couldn't have said it mm -hmm. any better. 
thank mm-hmm. you for that and for me i hope that you know at least answer the question and just to add a bit to that would be the fact that you're even asking this question it already shows that you're you, you really care for your kids and you're willing mm-hmm. to give them the best and i think just the right environment like you've been providing i'm sure mm-hmm. you know they won't lack anything so you got this okay yeah, um, and, and definitely I would agree that thing about having a loving and supportive family environment is the most important thing, I would say. And uh, Funmi, if you would like to get in touch with me after the program, if you'd like to take this conversation further, I'm happy to share some more personal stuff with you one to one. Okay. So, I do uh, so, an email introduction to both of yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yes, I would be happy my to sister. talk more to Funmi or any of the other folks in this chat who'd like to learn more about my growing up or just thoughts yeah. on all that. Mm-hmm. Now, as a roundup, I'd like for you to highlight your um, Instagram page. I remember when you just started, mm-hmm. but you're so dedicated. I mean, Ketcha will walk you through all the plans. You, you need to follow mm-hmm. her on Instagram. She has like over 3,000 people, and you can tell she's mm-hmm. very passionate. The way the way she th- talks about her science, even her work, and then plans. So talk to us a little bit about your um personal online your online ah, catch a plant scientist yes. thank you so much for asking yes so Talani when I would say that I have always loved talking communicating and explaining so as you remember from my days at, at UT Sciences Toastmasters that's being in Toastmasters International which is an international organization of public speaking clubs and that's where Talani and I met um Toastmasters was where I really honed my public speaking and communication skills. And in Toastmasters, I talked about a wide, wide range of subjects. And I use these skills in scientific presentations. Um, So in the world of academia, we usually have either conference presentations or lab meeting presentations where we often have slides with images and data. And we explain this in a very formal, structured way, using a lot of jargon to fellow scientists. Same thing with posters. This is basically a presentation just on one big tablecloth-sized piece of paper. And again, it's these can be really elegant and visually appealing, but they're often aimed specifically at fellow researchers. So even though I enjoy doing this style of communication, and I certainly apply a lot of my speaking skills from Toastmasters to it, I found that sometimes it was a bit dry. It was a bit limiting, you know, like you um, you couldn't use so many colorful figures of speech. You couldn't talk about the kind of beauty of the plants and what you were talking about in such a freeform way. So during the During the time of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, I was spending a lot more time here at my family home in the country in England. And I was so surrounded by the beauty of nature and the different seasons that I thought I would love to share this with the wider world somehow. So that's why I started my Instagram page, Catch a Plant Scientist. And on Catch a Plant Scientist, Although I'm currently taking a hiatus because I'm I'm trying to work quite intensely on my PhD thesis, and I have some family matters to attend to as well. I uh, was writing posts on a weekly basis where I would photograph plants in the surrounding nature in my own garden and write a short article with interesting and thought-provoking facts for a general audience, because I saw that there were so many people on Instagram who love plants, whether it's gardening, houseplants, floral arrangements, the collecting art of plants. But I found that there wasn't a big link between plant science and botany in an academic and scientific sense. And this huge community of plant lovers out there who love plants, but didn't know so much about the scientific side. So I wanted to be like a bridge to foster curiosity among plant lovers from all walks of life and get them interested in the scientific side of plants. I would say another thing that I did for science communication that I really enjoyed was back in 2018, I produced a temporary exhibit about plants versus aphids, kind of like a family-friendly temporary exhibit version of my research project with Professor Turnbull and some colleagues at Imperial Festival, and that was so much fun. It was a great challenge thinking about how do I explain these complex concepts in plant biology in a way that an elementary schooler could understand. And I really enjoyed presenting the posters and um, showing the pictures and the facts to people of all ages and all backgrounds who came by at the science festival. So I really enjoy science communication and I really like that 
it gives me a lot of personal satisfaction to help people see plants in a new way. And I love it when I can spark people's curiosity and appreciation of the world of plants. So I highly recommend checking out my Catch a Plant Scientist page. I have an Instagram, a YouTube, a TikTok, and a Facebook page as well. So I hope to see you all there in the near future. Handle so that way, but I also include in, in the show notes for those who yes, might want to it, contact you further. How can they sure. contact you? So, I would say that you can reach out to me. Uh, let's just put this on there, okay? Excuse me. So, catch a plant scientist that's how you can find me. So, it's catch a underscore, so it's catch a yes. spell K A T I A underscore mm -hmm. plant and then scientist. Uh -huh. That's right. So I would recommend just you can send me a private message through any of my pages if you'd like to have a chat about anything we've discussed in today's conversation. Yes, yes. Kasha, I want to thank you so much. This has mm -hmm. been a very, very insightful um, time with you, just learning more about your passion, mm -hmm. how your formative years um, really led you to where you are currently. And I think it's just a constant reminder of us for us that wherever we may be, whatever stage we may be, just keep pressing forward. Mm -hmm. It will all make sense, you know, at, the, at some point. That every action you engage in, not maybe every, but most of the things you're engaging in right now could help you in your future later. Mm -hmm. Like your love for science, your curiosity, your, you know, your, your strength of being able to communicate what you're doing to anyone in the room. Mm -hmm. I think those are um, notable um, characters. And I still recall even our time at Toastmasters, I served under Cassia and she was, I mean, she's a phenomenal <laughs> person and she led the, the club with passion. And I remember mm -hmm. your mom and her treats, you know, I, I always <laughs> remember her big goods. Halloween, um, festivities when we had mm -hmm. at the club there was always you know I mean catch yourself that's a very great leader and I want to just you know say that out there but I just want to say thank you for giving of yourself for uh, even answering all of the questions you have mm -hmm. and every time I'll look at aphids I'm not going to look at them the same way again <laughs> I'm going to look at them as freaky 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 they insane. are freaky indeed <laughs> oh Kalani you're so kind well I certainly have a lot of very happy memories of working with you and our other friends on the Toastmasters club that was a really highlight of my undergrad college year as being part of that lovely community. Oh, that's good to hear. And for everyone mm -hmm. who joined us, for Jonathan, questions for me, Miri, mm. and I think one of your friends, I think Eva Louise. Um, uh, yes. And, yes, she, Eve Louise, sorry. She had to run because mm -hmm. she was um, she was traveling. And also mm -hmm. Dr. Um, Omalaiwa, thank you all for joining. And those mm -hmm. on the Facebook page as well, sorry we didn't mention you. I just want to say thank you for joining us um, for today's session. Um, if you'd like to see more of this, just follow the show at, on Instagram at M-O-S-I-B-Y-L. That's the um, at Mosible, and the podcast is called the Mosible Podcast. In any <laughs> event, this has been more your host, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Take care and bye, everybody. Okay, okay, thank you so much. This was fun. Oh gosh, this was so much fun, Talani. Great questions. I really enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. And I, you. I think we had I think we had a very good balance between kind of things about my personal life and also things about the world of plant science. I think the balance was right on this time. I think so too. And um definitely your um contribution towards 